Good morning. How are you guys? Good to see you. Well, good to see you in the chat anyway. Let me get that fully open. There you are. Good morning, Marion Laird, Gloria Covington, Dex Williams, Stu Thaler, Mark Reel. Um, we've got an action-packed day today. We're going to get right to it in about a minute here. Um, first thing up is going to be Dennis Sands, uh, who is one of the two very, very top uh, score mixers in the business. Does tons of blockbusters. An old friend of mine from like 40 years ago. Um, we ran this last year and it was so good we decided it was one of the two things we were going to rerun this year. After that we're doing Succeeding in Sync, the Music Library's Perspective with Pat Weaver who's the head of production at Warner Chapel Production Music. Still a little groggy from the rally. Then we're going into uh, writing production music for TV with Steve Barden. That'll be great. Um, then after that, we're playing a thing with David Foster commenting the, yeah, like huge hit songwriter, producer, um, talking about master writer, which, uh, boy, he loves it. Um, and then we're going to do a redo, a live redo of a thing I did a few months ago with a highly successful taxi member, Keith Lou Brandt. Uh, the audio was so bad and the content was so good, we decided to redo it so that you guys can actually hear what the heck he's saying. Followed by Jason Bloom's songwriting power tools for 2022 and then wrapping up the, the road rally officially will be over. Um, 545 to 645, how to turn a good idea into a great song with Jai Joseph. So there you have it. Without any further ado, good morning once again, everybody. And here we go. Now we want to start taking a look at the, the mix itself and, you know, all the tracks and the elements. We're going to start with the strings and in particular we'll start with the violins and in particular from that the first violins. But before we start that, let's talk about a little bit about, again, the philosophy terms of the mix. Number one, balance. Left, right. How does this, you know, how does the balance feel? Want to keep it even, rich, full, so that neither side is dominant. So we really are feeling the full width and depth of the mix. And the number one way to achieve that is via panning. Okay, so with that in mind, let's take a look at the first set of tracks, in this case, first violins. And here they are right here. Right now I want to discuss a little bit about, we talked about earlier about rituals. So here's where rituals really, really come in very handy. So when I'm looking at a track and I hear it, I think, okay, I know where I want to position it. How do I know that? Okay, this is an action cue. It's an orchestral mock-up. Because it's an orchestral mock-up, I am simulating with samples an orchestra. And I have to think, okay, how is an orchestra laid out in this stereo spectrum? Well, thinking about from the podium perspective, as a conductor looking out into the orchestra, I have violins, first violins to the left, second violins next to them, violas center, cello right, basses behind cello. That's a traditional recording orchestral layout. And so I am looking to achieve that same positioning. So what does that tell me? I've got first violins, so First violins are to my immediate left. So let's again look at this track here. Here's the two channels, left and right. Okay, well, interestingly, the right channel is actually the heaviest channel and the dominant channel. So what do I do? I pan that to the extreme left but the left channel, I don't also pan to the extreme left. I have it mid-left. Why do I do that? Because if I pan both to the extreme left, it's so dominant to the left. 
sounds unnatural, but if I bring the, the left channel, the, the non-dominant channel, into the space a little bit, It gives it a little more dimension, and that adds to the reality of it. If you're in a room and you hear a live orchestra, if you hear just the first violins play, you don't really only hear them on the left side, even though they're sort of positioned there. It's certainly dominant on the left side, but they also emanate into the space, into the room. And we're simulating that. And panning is, a, is one great way to do that. Let's step back into the ritual discussion a bit. When I look at a track and I say, okay, I know how I want to pan these, but the first thing I do with any track is I have to determine where do I want these tracks to end up? What stem do I want to record these to? Well, I know I want to put these on string stem. Okay, so first thing I do is I assign to the string stem. It's extremely important and again it's a ritual I have the track before I even listen to it I assign it to the correct stem then I'll do panning then I add any effects I add any reverb I'll add then any EQ or anything else that I want to do next and that's the process the ritual that I that I use I do this repeatedly and I do this with every single track because it's the best way to make sure that we're going to I'm going to eliminate as many mistakes or potential mistakes as possible and it's just a, it's a great habit to get into ritual you always do it you develop your own rituals whatever they are the, this happens to be mine but you develop your rituals but do them over and over and over again. So it becomes second nature. You're not thinking about it anymore. You just do it. And it really pays off because in those late nights, you're tired, you have to deliver a particular mix or a set of mixes. The last thing in the world you want is that phone call. Oh, something's messed up. You, don't, you want to avoid that. Rituals are really valuable to help you avoid it. That's why I do them, and I strongly urge you to do the same. So, I have these, these tracks, so I'm going to listen to them again now. Now I've panned it, positioned it right. Okay, now as I listen to it, I feel, you know what, there's a lot of, on the sample itself, there's a lot of spatial component, I'm hearing a nice room component. I have enough reverb for now. I don't feel like I need to add anything. But it's a little, I want it to be a little more aggressive. It's a little dark, a little muddy. And so what have I done? I've added some EQ. What is this? This is a FabFilter Pro Q3. It's an EQ. It's a great Q from a company called FabFilter. Their plugins are excellent. Uh, they're musical. They sound good. I find them very, very functional. So what have I done? So we'll listen to this. And then here's without. Yep. And you can, you can watch me switch it in and out. In, out, and so you can hear how it's sort of cleaned it up a little bit, and it's added. I've added a little bit of top end. And so what have I done? I've I've got a, a, a high pass filter here, so I've rolled off some bottom end, and then I pulled a little bit out at around 450 or so. That just takes a little bit of that lower mid range kind of muddy area for violins. And I've added a little bit at about 6,500 cycles to sort of reach for the, sort of the rosin area of the, of the strings. And it gives it a little bit of an aggression, a little edge for action cues. I feel a very valuable component. 
so it, it cleans it up a little bit and it gives it a little bit of aggression which is kind of a cool quality to add to uh, uh, this you know string this kind of a you know kind of an aggressive element again no added room no added reverb for this particular track okay next up Okay, again, first violins. So notice the panning, same deal. First thing I do, look at the dominant track. In this case, it's the left channel. So I pan it over 100% to the left, but the non-dominant channel, I've panned all the way to the mid-right. So again, for the same purpose to give a little sense of dimension and space to this particular sound. Again, adding to the reality of it. In this case, I want to add some reverb. And the reverb I'm using is this. And this is a, a plug-in, a reverb plug-in, a beautiful plug-in. I, I, I use this quite a bit. It's from Exponential Audio, which is now owned by Isotope, and it's called Symphony 3D. And this particular plugin I can use because I work in a multi-channel environment quite often. I can use it certainly for stereo, but also f for 5.1, 7.1, or even Atmos. So it, you know, it has format options for all those particular specific formats, but also stereo. And it's a great sounding reverb, it's very natural, and again, very musical. And for users, especially for users that are just starting out, this is a great reverb, it sounds great. You, find, you, you know, there's tons of presets. You'll find one that's gonna work for you without a doubt. And you don't need to mess with it. And especially when you're starting out, don't mess with it. Just find a reverb that you really like that's working and just go with it. As you get more adept at this, you can experiment with, there's a, quite a few controls. You can, you know, parameters, you can make adjustments to just see how they work. Never anything wrong with that. You could always just reselect the uh, preset that you started with and it'll reset all the parameters. I find that generally speaking, uh, I don't actually make that many adjustments inside of the the reverb itself. The one adjustment I do make more often than not is the reverb time, the overall time, and then sometimes the width. But as far as these other parameters, not that often. Sometimes, but not that often. But anyway, here's what the it sounds like with the reverb. So it's a you know really a, a lovely sound, and I'm you. Why am I use, using it using as much as I am? Because reverb helps create a sense of depth, and to me that's you know I want to I want to add that component. Now this is an aggressive track. There's lots of actions, lots of activity. There's lots of things going on, but I still like to have that sense of stuff happening in the back. It's a, the perception of depth. You know, I want this and this. And you can achieve that. And one of the great ways to achieve it is the depth aspect is with reverb. Again, first thing, bussing. Second thing, panning. Then any inserts, EQ, compression, something like that. And then finally, reverbs. In this case, I thought it's a good sounding sample. And I really felt all it needed was the panning, and the reverb. And just quickly, speaking of samples, the strong recommendation, use the best possible samples you can get, always. For a composer, I think, I think one of the most important tools to have, there's two things. A great sample library, a series of sample libraries that'll work for you, and great stereo monitors. Those, are, those two things are really, really significant. 
they're the place to spend money. Not, you know, don't ever buy expensive microphones or preamps or any of that kind of stuff. Rent them. You want to create the best sample library you can because you will lose, you will use those every single day. But an expensive microphone or any microphone for that matter probably sits on a shelf, maybe use it once or twice a month. But sample libraries daily, constantly. They're really valuable and they're very, very important because you want to start with the best sounding material you can. It's, you, you know, you can't polish crap. You can't make bad sounding stuff sound great. You make it sound better, but you can't make it sound great. You need to start with really good sounding samples. By the way, these, you know, all these samples that Mark has for the most part really sound good. And there, you know, there's a number of uh, modern sample libraries that are excellent. Next set of tracks. Okay, again, a good sounding sample. I chose not to really do much of anything with it, except reverb. And again, same reverb. Use less of it on this track. Because I want, I want some spatial component, but I don't I don't need a lot of it. I want it. I don't want to mask too much of that energy in the performance. That's really, really important in an action cue. Again, that's part of what helps drive it. Now, same deal with the panning. Left channel's dominant, full left, right channel, mid right. Same reason. Okay, moving on. And this, so I don't have this as far left. You know, it's sort of sitting a little bit more towards the middle. It's almost, it's playing in a range that's almost a viola color. So f for me, I just, I didn't want it to sit too far. I wanted to move it into the, into the space a little bit more. Now, also, It seems a little dry and tight. I don't really hear the room component on this particular sample. So, but I, I want to feel that. I want it to, to have that room sense. So I have to add it. What do I do? And that's the first thing I'll do. Notice no other aspects. Again, a good sounding sample, don't need to do anything. Doesn't need EQ, doesn't need compression, doesn't need anything. A good sound to start with, which is key. So first thing I'm going to add is a room. I use Altiverb. Altiverb is, is a, for me, is a really, really wonderful plug-in. It's a convolute, what's called a convolution reverb, and it uses impulse responses. These are fancy names. Basically what they do is they'll go in and measure a particular space. In this case, I'm using the 20th Century Fox scoring stage, which is in Los Angeles. I'm very familiar with that stage. I've recorded on that stage many, many times. It's a great sounding room, beautiful space. And they being Altiverb engineers went into that space and through their, their measuring devices create what are called impulse responses. These are programs that more or less define the space itself so that you can utilize it inside of this plugin. And they, they have a great deal of spaces to choose from. If you buy the plugin, you can download these various impulse responses for free. Um, there's just a myriad of them, all kinds of everything from scoring stages, concert halls, small rooms, you know, metal pipes, and, you know, all kinds of sonic character that you can add for, you know, whatever sort of creative purpose uh, that, that you need it for. For me, 
Again, in this case, I'm using the 20th Century Fox scoring stage as a, a basis for this room because I want a scoring stage style room space. And so, so you, here I'll play it, I'll push it up so you can really hear. You can see it really gives it a, a, a real great spatial component. And then additionally, I add that same hall reverb. You can hear it, hear the, the reverb tail. So add it in with everything we have so far. Okay, so it's all blending nicely so far. Um, obviously got a long way to go, but you know, that's, you're getting a sense now of at least where, what my approach is and how I'm basically sort of panning and thinking about these strings, these vi first violins now. So for the celli, we need to think again about pan. Where are we gonna position them? Well, again, celli to the right. So. That's basically my approach for the panning of the celli. So first track up. Okay, again, a good sounding sample. Um, and first thing, look at the pan. Dominant track. As it should be, the right channel. But again, s similar concept in that the non dominant channel is still leaning to the right, but just a little bit off of center towards the right. This is it here. So that, again, always the same idea, give it a sense of space. But. This, this is a pretty specific kind of sound. So this is, this is giving an energy. It's almost, it's clearly not a pitz, but it's an aggressive arco sound. So I want to give it that a little bit of a pinpointing, a little bit of a spot as opposed to wide in terms of the pan. So that's why I've, taken the non, non-dominant channel and leaned it over towards the right as well. Okay, so I did want to add this J37. And again, this feels a tiny little bit gritty to me, so I want to warm it up a bit. And this is the perfect kind of plug-in to do that. And here's without it. And in. Start again. Out. In. And 
And you can hear it especially towards the bottom end of this particular kind of, uh, for this particular track. Uh, but it also smooths out that little bit of that, that sort of grittiness of it, of this, you know, kind of digital sample. So, okay. And now, for some EQ. Again, the air EQ. And you'll notice very subtle. So just a little bit of that, you know, it's again about the 300, 350 range, taking a tiny little bit off. Remember, with this air EQ, the, the amounts are a little more aggressive than the fab filter EQ was. So, you know, again, you have to judge by listening. It's not always a, a numeric thing. You want to listen. Always trust your ears. You develop your, your ability to hear frequencies and understand what the equalizer is doing. The better you're at that, the more um, the more uh, competent you're going to be at dealing with all these plugins and all you know the whole this whole concept of mixing. So I'm taking a little bit off it again around the 300 range, and adding at about 2,100 cycles, just a touch. So it, 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 it gives it, uh, a, again, what, in, what I'm feeling is a little tiny bit of energy. And then at the very top, right over here, is this, this little air. It's the, what, what this plugin's named for, this, this air component, if you will. And let me, I'll turn it off. And on. Again, off, on. And it just gives it a tiny little bit of clarity and, uh, you know, added clarity. And um, again, same deal. It's very subtle, but it's really meaningful. Now, remember, we're starting out with good sounding samples. So we don't need to do a bunch of anything to it. But specifically for this track and listening to this sample in context with everything else, these are the choices I made. And it's always going to be that. It's always going to be with everything else, listening to everything and how each track sits in with everything else and what this piece of music is doing and how I want it to ultimately play. And then I didn't need, I felt it had enough ambience, again, for what it's doing in this track. I didn't feel I needed to add anything further. So in with everybody else. Okay, and it fits in nice. And again, balance. Now we're hearing how things are balancing out nicely. So we're, they're not playing the same part by any means, but they're almost speaking to one another, the way it's written and all. So it's, it's, it's really a, um, the, the mix is starting to settle in already, and we've got a long ways to go. Okay. Next cello track, just this little thing here, okay. Now, it's a small part, but first thing I wanted to do is add, is add the EQ and just clean it a little bit. That's all I'm doing. 
here's 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 it out and in. So just again, not a lot subtle, but just cleaning it. What does it do? To, to my ears, it already sounds a little brighter, a little cleaner, a little less, a little less plodding. It just by taking a little bit of that, you know, 300 or so cycles out, it just cleans up and exposes more the, the top end, the brightness. Okay. Now, I'm adding room reverb. And one thing I wanted to mention before we get to the reverb is the panning. Notice... Dominant channel goes almost full right, not quite, but almost full right, and non-dominant is mid-left. So for this, I wanted to give a little more dimension. Okay, and then the room. Here's with it out. And with it in. So again, it's giving it a little more of that spatial component. And then the hall reverb. And notice, not much, not much, but just a just just a bit to give it a little bit of that spread, a little bit of dimension. And with everybody. That's it. Okay, next cello track. Okay, same pan as the previous track. And again, pretty good sounding sample, so I didn't feel the need to do anything other than reverb. But the same room. You can hear the little bit of the tail, the, the room reverb. Okay. It's, it's, you know, again, just to give a little bit of the expanse. And then the hall. So it's a little bit. Now, the reason I'm real light with the reverb on these kinds of tracks that have a lot of the motion to them is that I don't want to smooth that out. Remember, this is an action cue. There's, there's um, a lot of energy to this. There's a lot of parts. There's a lot of movement. And if I pile on reverb, it kind of softens all that. It smooths it all out. I don't want to do that. I want to keep it kind of aggressive. And so I'm, I want some reverb because I do want it to, to give, I do want to give it a dimension. But I don't want to take away from any of the energy. And if I add too much reverb, it's going to, it's going to diffuse some of that energy. And I don't want to do that. So I'm cautious with it. 
especially early on. Is if, if I were to get into the mix and I felt, eh, maybe I could use a little more, I'll make that adjustment. But I start out being very conservative with the amount of reverb, especially the hall reverb. That's the, that's the reverb that has longer tail that takes up space. The other thing is if there's a lot of parts, a lot of pieces to the cue, um, I want to have as much clarity as I possibly can. And again, the more reverb, it just takes up the space, the transparency. So I'm cautious with it. Okay. So again, in with everybody. Okay. Next cello part. Okay, so for this, EQ. So again, done the same thing, taken away a little bit. This is a little bit under 300 cycles. And then I'm uh, adding uh, not quite 3 dB at almost 6,000 cycles. Because I again, I'm looking for the that rosin, that edge, the bow. Um, you know, I obviously want the, the tonality, but that's not really what this is doing. This is really providing an energy and an edge. And then... Uh, Next up, and again, before we get there, we'll talk about the panning. We notice same kind of pan, not quite extreme right for the dominant channel, which is the right channel, and then mid-left for the non-dominant. And then um, hall. I'm sorry, room reverb. You can hear the room. Out. In. So it really, it really gives it that kind of spatial quality. It really, it really sounds like it's in a room. This is, again, this Altiverb uh, is a really excellent uh, plug-in for this purpose. And then finally, the hall. So you can hear the, the longer tail on the hall. Okay, and then in context with everybody. So it sits in well, again, subtle underneath, but it's, you know, it's playing its part and it just sits in really nicely in the context of all the string parts. Okay, and now we're ready to move on to the basses. And finally, we're at the basses. And so for the, we'll just talk quickly about the bass panning. Bass panning, we look at this first track, we see the bass panning very similar to the celli. 
um, more or less in similar position in the in the you know s sort of in the scope the stereo spread and for this track we see sort of exactly the same approach dominant channel all the way to the right non-dominant channel mid left and again another good sounding sample so what I what do I need really nothing beyond the room and hall it is a little present so So the first thing I want to do is add the room. Now, I don't have a lot of it, but you know, good, you know, reasonable amount. And then the hall. Okay. And in context, So again, if we listen to this track, I don't have a huge amount of reverb on it. Another thing about those low strings that uh, you want to be careful, again, especially relative to an action cue. Uh, a lot of reverb on low strings and it can get muddy very quickly. And again, you don't want to do that. You're trying to give it a good amount of clarity and transparency, to, and you don't want to mask the energy again. Too much reverb, and you get this muddy, darker quality, and it just tends to start to mask things. So again, I tend to be conservative with uh, reverb for the most part and on bass tracks. Okay, next up. Again, another very, very nice sounding uh, uh, sample. Okay, so first up is some EQ. Again, the Air EQ. Okay, so here's it out. And in. And so I'm adding a little bit in the 150 cycle range. Push the lower, the, the upper low mid, low range, the upper range of the low frequency um, to just give it a little bit of oomph in the bottom end, um, but not too low. One of the reasons I want to be very careful in the, 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 the extreme low end is we have some low percussion coming up, especially Gran Casa and low sub stuff that we want to make sure we have space for that. We don't want to have anything conflict with that. And that's what we want to give the real bottom end to. So not these elements at all. But I still want to I go for the 150 cycle range. It's a little bit of that lower tonality. And then immediately I'm rolling off a little bit 
right after it at around 300 cycles. And it gives a sort of a, it helps give a little clarity to the bottom end. We've got a little boost for, for a little oomph and yet I'll taken out a little bit of that, that area that tends to, to mask uh, some of the higher frequencies. And then a tiny little boost at uh, 1250 to sort of, it just enhances a bit of the growl in this, in this sample, which is very cool. And then the same deal, um, room. Push it up a bit. Here's without the room. And with it. Okay. And then the hall. And what it helps, it, it, what it, one of the, another thing that it helps is gives a little bit more to the sustain. So, in addition to giving it dimension, a little depth, it helps with the sustain a little bit, which is nice and more natural quality. Not a huge amount, but it's meaningful. And then again, the pan, same thing. You see it, this pan matches this pan. So here in context. So it's all kind of blending really nicely, and it feels good. Again, we're getting a good sense of the width, and and yet the you know the blend feels real. You know, it feels like an orchestra, which is obviously the goal. Okay, next track. Base pits. Again, first of all, same pan. Pretty consistent with this. Trying to, you know, have it feel like a section, a base section. So by matching the pans, my thinking is to try and keep it as if this was the section playing these parts. Again, nice pin, very nice sample. I keep saying that, but it really, really helps. And then again, same deal, room. And hall. And you know it's it's doing its job. Um, don't need to, you know, do much to it. You know, like I said, it's just panning and a little bit of the the room and hall. Again, being very conservative with that. Okay. Next up, it's one little event.
This is a, uh, um, it's, it's called uh, base pits, but it's, it's almost like a light Caleno. And for this, I felt it had enough of the room. I just added a little bit of the A little bit of the hall verb. And in context. I kept it very light. I was, again, I wanted to be careful not to draw attention too much to this. So I kept it, I kept it in there. Maybe a little more. Okay. W one thing about something like a Caleno, um, it's a very sharp attack, and it's very specific, and it can really draw your attention. And I wasn't feeling the need to do that with this sound in this particular context, in this mix. So I kept it just playing under there. I can feel it more than anything. And for me, that was adequate. Okay, next track. Okay, so this has enough room and ambience on it uh, for, for my taste, and, and again, in context. But it's just, you know, maybe a, a, just a touch dark, a little, little muddy and a little thuddy. So Here's the EQ I chose, which was the again the Fab Filter Pro Q3, and I'm rolling off some of this bottom end. You know, it's starting right around right around 100 cycles or so, but then pushing up a bit right here, but then coming down here. And then also coming up a little bit at, at 1,000 cycles. So. So the 1,000 cycles is, again, a little bit of that attack. And then the 100 cycles gives it a little bit of that oomph, a little bit of that warm, bigger bottom end. Here's, here's with it out. And with it in. Just a touch more dramatic, I think, uh, with, with this EQ in. And that's all I'm doing. I'm not adding anything else. And in context. And so I have enough of the attack from the celli of that that um, of this particular uh, passage, and so I'm using the bass and why I added a little bit of that bottom end to sort of round out the bottom of this event. This is really obviously a combination of the celli and the basses, and this 
space-based track. So the combination is this. we have base trim. And for this, the only change here really is the pan, again, dominant channel, hard right, non-dominant channel, mid right. And so this pushes that over to the side And in context, so it gives a, again balance. So that's you know that is supplying really tension. That's what the the trim does, and I wanted to. I wanted to feel it over towards the right. I don't want it to to bleed into the to the room really very much. So I've kept it, you know, it has a dimension, but I wanted it to really lean to the right pretty significantly. So that's what this is. And that's it. So those are the bases and those are all the strings. <laughs>